Obesity is now the biggest health crisis in the world. For the first time in history, children are facing shorter lives than their parents. We're eating poorly and we're getting fatter. It's a huge burden on the health system. What can we do? Hi, I'm Simon Galt and I'm a chef and I've had a life of food. And let me tell you, I've loved every moment of it. But unfortunately, I've become fat and now I've developed type 2 diabetes, which is slowly killing me. So I'm now on a mission to find out, why are we fat? In the first episode, I talked to experts about processed food and how its refined ingredients are contributing to our obesity epidemic. All while going on my personal journey where I discovered that 40% of my body was fat. Not the prettiest picture in the world. I was told I was the O word. Obese. And the visceral fat was squashing my internal organs. So I've actually got to get off my ass and make some change that can get rid of my diabetes and mean I can live longer. All done to answer the question, why are we fat? My worst nightmare has arrived. I'm at the Auckland University of Technology Human Potential Centre. I'm not human potential, I'm about to do exercise. I hate exercise, I break into a cold sweat at the thought or look of a gym. I'm, I'm dreading this, but I've got to find out just how fit I am. I want it over and done with as fast as possible. Wish me luck. Just the thought of going to the gym and I break into a sweat. God knows what I've let myself in for here. Thank you. Exercise wise, have you been up to much? I uh, regularly walk to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> and other than that, not a lot. I do have a little gym set up in a garage where I have a cross trainer. Any frequent walking from home or elsewhere? I wouldn't say frequent, but the odd walk. The odd walk, OK. So I don't mean to be evasive, but um, I guess... Before I get to strap my stuff on the treadmill, I'll have to be strapped with some super sensitive electrodes, but to get them to stick, okay. they're going to have to All do right. a little bit of manscaping. Slide that there and I'll let uh, Avon sort you out. Hmm, perhaps a lot of manscaping. From your body. Fill your boots, why yeah, don't you? Yeah, yeah, so... <laughs> Just a bit of palpating as we call it there, just to find the correct landmarks and then I'm just removing the hair on that area. We'll hook you up to the, the leads. I can't get my shirt on quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the gold standard way of measuring your cardiovascular fitness. This will give us some information to be able to prescribe exercise appropriately for you as well. Um, so for this one, we've got a mass system. Um, it's going to be measuring your breathing that's going in and out, um, how much oxygen, how much carbon dioxide. Um, but one of the big things for that fitness is how much oxygen you can utilise, um, you know, while you're under right. some stress of the exercise, OK? So what we'll do is I'll ask you just to hold that against your face there. Yep, just there for me. And uh, we'll bring this harness piece up. Bring that over top. Nice and firm there now. Mm -hmm. All right, so hopefully just a, a nice little warm up initially. A little easier speed for you. All right, how's that, Simon? That okay? Yep, excellent. The test starts at a gentle pace, but every 30 seconds or so they crank up the speed and the incline, all while keeping a careful eye on my heart rate and blood pressure. All right, Simon, so about uh, 40 seconds to that next speed kicks in, and that'll be the peak speed, and thereafter will be incline, OK? Uh, it's starting to get pretty hard, okay. and wearing a gas mask yep. isn't making it all that much fun. Oh, it's pretty nice tough going time. about so. now. Being fit might help. Good stuff. It's about a minute left there. <sighs> 
<sighs> if you know if you want to stop. Yep. Go outside. That's it. It'll come down. It'll come down. That's it. Keep walking. Keep walking. Done very well. Great stuff, Simon. <laughs> nice job. I'll let you breathe easy. Finish strong. Okay. Here we go. Whew. How was that? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> cool. All right. So we'll let you come I'm on down. I'm still alive. Wasn't all that bad, I suppose. <laughs> but warm. All right. <laughs> So what will the numbers tell our experts? Here to help me figure it out is fitness guru Nigel Harris. Um, basically, what we know is that you are unfit, but we also know that your heart is in good condition, and so we've got some a really good base to work from. We know that we can push you a little bit and really get that fitness up. So being honest, on the unfitness scale from way down here somewhere. So you're down at the bottom, you're down in what we'd call the fifth percentile. What that means is you can get fitter, which is great. So that's a kind way of saying you're bloody unfit. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fearing more bad news, I leave and take what's left of my dignity with me. Besides, I've just received a call from Dr. William Ferguson, who says the results of my gene tests have just come in. So I'm back at the doctor's office to see what part my genes have to play in making me fat. Okay, Simon, well, I think we've found some really important insights from this genetic information we've got on you. And I think probably the first thing I want to say is reassure you, the news today from me is going to be a lot better than the news from the MRI. Because, Christ because, because, because everything I'm going to tell you is going to have some sort of silver lining to it as to, you know, as to how we tackle it. Right, okay. So just to briefly summarise, you know, why I think you've struggled, you know, with your weight, with what you've done... The first thing is you've got uh, poor functioning of your leptin receptors. And what that means is that the signal that your brain gets that you're full, you know, is very faint. It's like a faint... <laughs> that explains you know, a you know, lot. You know, when you've eaten food, you know, it's like a really faint voice way down the end of the corridor saying, Simon, you know, you've had enough. It's not like that. It's... Um, Let's eat more. It, yes, Go that's on, right. The, the, the message is not getting through. The second thing that's really important is that we've found that your Amy1 gene predicts that your risk of becoming obese, specifically in response to carbohydrate in the diet, is increased 800%. Your body is not adapted and evolved genetically to deal with a big carbohydrate load. Uh, the flip side of that is that we're also going to have to limit the fat component of your diet. We don't want you on a literally high-fat diet because you've also got a number of genes that won't behave well with that. The next thing that came out in your profile was that you have high levels of oxidative stress in your system because your antioxidant defense mechanisms are somewhat underpowered. And given what we know about oxidative stress, it's very important that you don't over-exercise. The lack of exercise for you is, is absolutely critical. You know, if, if you're inactive with those genes, they're going to behave very badly. If you do even a bit of exercise, you're going to greatly improve their function in a, in a positive way. So I think that's going to uh, uh, deliver a lot of benefits for us. Hmm. So I'm unfit, I'm obese, I've got a gene that only 20% of the population has that makes me 800% more likely to put on weight if I eat a high carbohydrate diet. Not only that, but I can't eat too much fat either. And to top it off, I need to exercise more than most people. Awesome. But before I start a journey towards good health, I've got one more thing I have to do. I've heard what will happen if I don't manage my diabetes, but I've yet to see it. I've come to Middlemore Hospital in South Auckland where Dr Murray Cox has agreed to introduce me to a few patients suffering the ill effects of diabetes. Hey, hey, how are you going? That sounds like Murray Cox. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, all's good. Hey, everything's fine. Simon Ho's had diabetes for over 20 years now, and uh, so, as you can see, a really cheerful, positive chap, but he's, he's, he has, has had quite a few of the complications of diabetes that develop. Ho recognises my voice rather than me because he's almost totally blind. He's on the dialysis machine there. That's because his 
kidneys don't function properly anymore. Uh, why I see them particularly is they've also had trouble with bad infections and and blood supply to the to the to his feet. And um, Hose now had a below knee amputation on the right leg for about four or five years. Yep. And just a few months ago, we had to amputate the left leg as well after many attempts to try and and, and keep hold of it. Yep. Two years, eh? Yeah. Two years Two fighting year, yeah. to try and keep it. Yeah, that's right. As a young man, Ho led an active lifestyle and coached a woman's softball team. But at the tender age of 19, his life changed forever. Just one day at uh, women's practice, I went to go catch a high ball and just started uh, seeing flashes on my eyes. Um, felt a little bit dizzy. <clears throat> so I went to the doctor and, and then told me that um, I had diabetes and uh, didn't know what that was, never heard the word before. And uh, was telling me all the complications that you can get, uh, blindness, lose a limb. But at 19, your mental maturities, those things don't register. And, um, you know, you feel as strong as an ox and a doctor tells you that these things could happen. And I guess I started feeling some of the symptoms when I was about probably 35, um, a bit of tingling in the feet and um, a little bit of numbness and that just kind of gradually got a little bit worse. And then I decided to go see uh, the doctor and um, that word diabetes came back again and um, had tests done, a biopsy on the kidneys and um, yeah, found out that my kidneys are already at 50%. So within a year, um, doctors telling me that um, I'll be going on to dialysis and just trying to uh, get your head wrapped up around that is, um, it took a while. What hits me is how quickly things deteriorate if diabetes is ignored. Another patient, Brett, was diagnosed 16 years ago. And when he first found out, he didn't take it seriously. At the beginning, I wasn't controlling it very well. And um, my blood sugar levels were all, all over the place. And uh, by the time I got more disciplined and was controlling it well, um, unfortunately, the complications had to set in by that stage. The trouble with diabetes is sort of, you live with it for quite a long time and with seemingly no real signs of problems. Yeah, I know, you know, my blood sugar levels are high and all these sorts of things, but you know, what's that? Nothing really bad has happened yet. By the time you, um, you, something bad does happen, it's too late, you can't reverse the process. So, has it just tipped life completely upside down for you? I mean, a stupid thing to say, you, you know, you don't have your legs, but... It has, and, because, uh, you know, I can't, I can't drive, I, I can't use my boat, so fishing is, I love fishing. And so, basically, we'll just carry it on one day at a time, one bit at a time. Seeing how the patients deal with their misfortune is inspiring, but the sheer damage diabetes causes is overwhelming, particularly how blood flow to the feet and legs is severely restricted, causing many patients to endure intense pain and eventually amputation. Removing a limb can ease the complications, but often new problems arise after the procedure. Foot care becomes very important in diabetic patients, and fortunately, I'm just having a look here. I see Miss uh, Riders had, a, had to have a toe removed in the past, and this area here is where there's been a lot of pressure put on that area, and that's a, a problem that we often see in diabetic patients the ability to fight the infection is not as good as in a normal person. So how long have you had diabetes for now? Uh, 15 years. 15 years. And is there anything you do differently now? Any, give me some advice is what I'm asking for. <laughs> Don't eat the wrong food for real, that's for real. What sort of food would you normally have eaten? Oh, like McDonald's, fish yeah. and chips, pizza, yeah. practically every night. 
So kind of living on that. Yeah, that so life. living on that life. Yeah. So in hindsight, it's just eat, eat differently, huh? Yeah. All these patients have learned the hard way that their diet and lifestyle led them to where they are. The damage to the body is obvious, but also your mind has to cope with the challenges. It can be a, a hard journey trying to wrap your head around uh, the mental things that, that, that go on and the changes in the body. Mm. But um, having people that you can talk to, like for me even now, um, it, helps, it helps me uh, to try and sort through uh, the psychological things. Mm. So um, I thank you, Simon. Well, talking to us today is really appreciated and you'll be helping a lot of people. So thank you very, very much. If it helps one person, Simon, then yeah. it's all worth it. Meeting those three people with type 2 diabetes complications was really quite frightening. I've been told that with type 2 diabetes you could possibly lose a limb, lose your eyesight, go on dialysis. But when you actually see it, that's when it really hits home. And I hope lots of other people have had a wake-up call like I've just had. Arms down, head down, Hey, awesome. I've now seen with my own eyes what will happen to me if I don't make change, but it's really for the most important person in my life. One, two, three. <laughs> Was that good? I've returned to AUT in Auckland to see fitness expert Nigel Harris, who's worked out an exercise regime for me. And you all know how much I love exercise. So Simon, I've had a good chat with Dr Ferguson about your um, genetic testing results, had a look at your scan results and your fitness tests. The good thing is that um, your genetic test actually confirms the approach that I would have liked to have taken with you anyway, and that is that absolutely critical for you is to do some good structured resistance training There'll be short, sharp, potent doses of exercise and then a lot of just general activity. So we're going to try to limit the amount of time that you spend sitting and doing nothing by just injecting general movement into your day. I'm actually really hoping at the end of it that I'm enjoying it and I keep doing it because that's going to be the longevity key. As I'm quickly discovering, resistance training is just a fancy way of saying weightlifting. Something I didn't do too much of in my youth, but something that Nigel assures me will be very good for me. Visceral fat, we can target with, in particular, resistance training. It seems to, for some reason, burn that fat off, and preferentially as well. The science about exercise and diabetes is that it's a miracle drug. Exercise is very much medicinal for type 2 diabetes. When you contract a muscle in some way, it sets off a whole cascade of physiological processes which improve those mechanisms. So right now, this is setting off the processes which are improving your ability to control your glucose and be sensitive to insulin, so you're doing yourself some good, even with these little muscular contractions. Cool, just let it down slowly and lock it off. Life begins. I've never really been into exercise, but I'm not alone. In New Zealand, 48% of the population don't do enough exercise. We seem to have engineered a lot of movement out of our lives. If you look at industry, if you look at what people are doing to, in the urban environment, if you look at driving to work, if you look at the built environments where we're living and working, there is less incidental activity around that, and that's a, that's a huge part of it. If you think about what some people do, they, stay, they sleep, they get up and sit down at the breakfast table, they sit in the car to go to work, they then sit in the cafe for their morning tea, they'll sit at the desk all day, they'll sit down for lunch, sit back at the office desk, sit down in the car to drive home, sit down for dinner, and then sit down and watch, what is it, average Kiwi, a few hours of TV a night. And that is then repeated over and over again. Now that clearly is not a good thing. Okay, so what's the best exercise to stop you getting fat? What you can do is have good general activity, that's fundamental, don't be sedentary, but do a few short sharp hits of very potent semi-structured exercise in some way. Now resistance training is a huge part of that, so some sort of weight training. 
and maybe some bursts of activity where you're actually uh, experiencing breathlessness. We need to use our muscles. We have to strenuously contract our muscles for uh, to be healthy for life. And I think a lot of us are missing that. So what we can do in a setting with some sort of structured resistance or weight is replace that. And it doesn't take long, it takes some effort uh, and a little bit of structure, but if you can do that, it's an incredibly potent thing. So I'd say for everyone, they should do it. Doesn't matter where you go, junk food is everywhere. And when you're really hungry, it's damn near impossible to resist. I mean, I'm a chef. I cook with some of the freshest, healthiest ingredients. You'd think I'd know better, right? But when I walk past a hot dog stand and I'm starving, forget hey, about Dad. it. Good, how about your song? Good, thank you. Can I have one American hot dog? Sure, do you want uh, sauerkraut or red onion sauce on that? Sure. In the US alone, 20 billion hot dogs are consumed each year. Yes, I said billion. Actually, make that 20 billion in one. And when buying a hot dog, you've got to add the ketchup, the mustard, the onions, and the sweet relish. Mmm. So what we've got here is your classic American hot dog. The interesting thing about the actual sausage in here that is full of mechanically separated turkey, mechanically separated pork, water, and then the next ingredient, cane sugar. And then there's a whole bunch of other ingredients which are colorings, preservatives, and flavorings. Actually, the problem is my brain is getting all the, the, the cues of eat it because it smells good, it looks good, I'm salivating, I know it's gonna taste good, I know it's gonna be yummy. So, I'm sorry, but I just, I gotta do it. good. <laughs> so to put it mildly, junk food is very popular. Americans spend over a hundred billion on it every year and each day one person in every four will eat a takeaway meal. We know this stuff is bad for us, so why are we so attracted to it? The brain is hardwired to prefer certain food properties and those include fat, they include sugar, salt, protein, starch, because those are the things that kept our ancestors alive in a very rigorous, tough environment. The motivation to get those calories was a great thing because they were always struggling to get enough calories. In our world today, it's the liability because we're drowning in calories. It's not just a matter of calories or taste, but it turns out this stuff is just as bad as alcohol or drugs. When you eat carbohydrate or fat, sugar, salt, that sends a signal up to your brain and that releases dopamine. And people like to think about dopamine as the pleasure chemical, but in fact what it is is a motivation and learning chemical. So when dopamine gets released in your brain, your brain says, hey, this is really good stuff. I really like what you just ate. And I'm gonna remember all the properties of that food, like the appearance and the smell and the taste and I'm gonna make you really motivated to seek those things out next time. If you're walking down a typical street in an urban environment, you're gonna be bombarded by lots of food cues. You're gonna be experiencing smells, you're gonna be experiencing sights of foods that are very compelling to the brain. And once that goes beyond a certain threshold, we call it addiction. I've heard the word addiction mentioned before, but that was just for sugar. But Stephen's saying that junk food has addictive qualities. It remains controversial whether food addiction actually really exists clinically, but there's no doubt that a lot of people exhibit addiction-like relationship with food. And people aren't getting addicted to celery and lentils. People are getting addicted to foods that are these calorie-dense combination of the properties that your brain is looking for, these properties that cause dopamine release in the brain. There's a reason it's called comfort food. It's because certain types of foods actually really do make you feel emotionally better. And so when we're in a tough situation, we're stressed, we're feeling sad, we go for these comfort foods, but that can cause us to eat too much and eat unhealthy food. 
So how do we convince our brain not to desire these foods anymore? We really don't have any conscious control over that dopamine release, so we can't, we can't directly shut it off. However, what we can do is avoid those cues that cause it to spike. So avoid the food ads, the billboards, the smells. The longer you go without eating those really tempting foods that cause dopamine to spike, your motivation to go for those things will gradually decrease. And cues that predict those things, like the smell or the sight of those things, will have less and less power over you over time if you're not exposing yourself to them regularly. When it comes to obesity and diabetes, I'm not alone. One in three New Zealand adults are obese, but some parts of the population, particularly Maori and Pacific Island people, suffer much worse rates than that. I loved it. I'm at the Otara Markets in South Auckland with Dr. Gerhard Sunborn, a New Zealand-born Tongan with a special interest in the health and diet of Pacific Island people. Our communities, we're eating diets that are high in sugar, high in saturated fat, and high in salt. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the food is coming from, from uh, takeaways, and you know, and dairies and things like that. So that's what's causing the, um, the unhealthy statistics that our community in particular have. For Pacifica, uh, our our overweight and obese uh, population is about 60% for for Pacifica. But um, research that I've conducted, we found that women over 35 years, 100% uh, were either overweight or obese. And for Pacific men, it was about 96%. There's a perception that Pacific people value being bigger. But generally, uh, when you look at the evidence, especially recent evidence from surveys of, of our Pacific young people, that, that's untrue. Pacific people's desire to be lean and healthy is just as great as everyone else's, but in recent years, they've been hit hard. 30 years ago, diabetes was quite rare. However, now it's very common. About a quarter of our Pacific population had diabetes. So yeah, one in four of our Pacific community have diabetes. The weight gain in Pacific people has been gradual over several decades, and Gerhard believes it began when they migrated to New Zealand and left their usual diets behind. Before, when our communities came from the islands in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we were coming from quite a different place. And, you know, as time goes on, even the islands is getting like here in New Zealand, and we're having a lot of um, unhealthy processed foods sent, sent there from places like New Zealand and, and the US and Australia. So um, it's getting harder there to maintain a healthy weight as well. The foods that are easily available and accessible for our Pacific communities are energy dense, they're high sugar, and unfortunately they're everywhere. And so a natural consequence of the environment we live in is that we're gonna put on weight and become obese. So when you think about it like that, it, yeah, it, it makes it hard to maintain a healthy weight. One school in South Auckland didn't wait around for help. They acted, and they've made major changes for the better when it comes to food. Wow, you guys look awesome. I just wanted to get my camera out and take photos of you so I could go and show everybody how great you look. Congratulations, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. And I think what you are doing for New Zealand is awesome. And now the world is watching you guys. Indara Primary is located in the poorer part of Auckland. Most of the kids are Pacific Island or Maori descent, and many come from struggling families. Susan Dumlock saw the effects of this when she took over the role of school principal more than 10 years ago. Susan, what was the school like when you took over? Children were amazing. However, we had high um, truancy, poor attendance. We're talking about 50, 50 to 70% of the school year being missed by many children. 
and um, of course we also had really poor behaviour. The children's lunches were full of junk food and fizzy drinks and the kids were suffering. There were a lot of what are probably obese children, a lot of big children. There wasn't a lot of activity in the school. With obesity sometimes there might be not the same energy and probably the food that the children were eating discouraged them from taking part in physical activity as well. So in 2006, the school took it upon themselves to make a change. Literally overnight, they abolished all soft drinks and went water only. Immediately, there was a sense of calm within our classrooms and within our playgrounds. We tracked our behaviour as well and um, dramatic reduction overnight. So it became a very happy place instantly. Hi, everybody. How's the water going? Good? The kids are also encouraged to bring healthier lunches to school. What have you got in your sandwich? Tomato. Tomato. Oh, awesome. Yummy. And that looks pretty healthy bread with all those seeds in there, doesn't it? I remember the first pieces of bread that I saw coming in. I remember the first pieces of fruit we saw coming in. Just that ripple effect, it's just passed on. And within a very short period of time, it was just adopted right throughout the school. Over years, we've just noticed a gradual decline in the weight of our children. Um, once we did have a lot of bigger children, whereas now most of our children are really within a healthy range. To emphasise the point, some students show me the school uniforms kids were wearing just 10 short years ago. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> that is pretty big. <laughs> what do you think? I bet the three of you could get into those all together. <laughs> The three of you could fit in there, don't you think? Oh. Holy moly. <laughs> Go on, try it on. <laughs> try it on. <laughs> Look at those. Look, we can get five people in there. <laughs> yeah, on the other side as well. <laughs> so healthy. Eating works, right? Congratulations to you guys. That's awesome that you don't have to wear those clothes. <laughs> Across the Tasman, Australian Aboriginal people have also seen metabolic disease rates skyrocket. In 1982, Karen O'Day ran an experiment to see what returning them to an ancestral diet would do. The people in this study were 14 Aboriginal people from the Moan, Jum and, and Associated communities in Derby, in Western Australia. Uh, ten of them had diabetes and four of them didn't have diabetes. We went to the coast and we had two weeks on the coast eating a lot of fish and seafood. And then we came inland and lived on a river for about another three weeks. Living off the land, women would collect honey and yams, which were rich in carbohydrate, and the men hunted kangaroos, a rich source of protein. Everything edible on an animal carcass or a fish was eaten. Organ meats were very um, highly prized. The hunter, for example, got uh, the brain and any of the organs and would often have cooked the, the very fresh liver um, at the site of killing. The active lifestyle and nutrient-rich diet saw major positive changes in everyone, diabetic or not. So over the whole six weeks, they lost about eight kilograms on average, and their blood glucose had come down virtually to normal. I guess what I say to people now, and, I, and when I talk to Aboriginal people, I say, you know, we've learnt from your traditional lifestyle and your traditional diet. And in fact, we'd all be better off if we ate much more in that model. It's only in the West, in a way, that we have changed our diet so much. And so really, I think we've got a lot to learn full stop from traditional diets of populations all around the world. My new exercise regime is well and truly underway, and Luke, my personal trainer, has promised to Shoulders kick down, my butt three days a week. The best exercise for me based on my genes is high-intensity training, or HIT 
for sure. And what's known as complex movements, which works different muscles all over my body. Plus a few exercises I'm sure Luke's thrown in for his own personal okay. amusement. That hurts. Looks, looks, looks like you're enjoying it. <sighs> Three months of this and I'll either be fit or dead. Oh, big stretch. Oh. And good. Remember, this is our resting time. Let's get this I hope you guys don't like them either. <laughs> well, there's so much food out there, it's hard to know just what to cook. Nutritionist Mickey Willardin has a plan that will set things straight. Simon, someone like you, um, if we just strip it right back to basics, I think you're going to be better off focusing on good quality protein sources, a good amount of fibre at each meal, and the addition of some good fats to help with satiety as well. Because of your genetic predisposition to um, not dealing well with saturated fat, I think that for you, um, leaner cuts of meat are probably better. Red meat, you know, beef lamb, also poultry, free range, I quite like. Um, fish is another really good source of protein. Um, and of course, your fattier fish actually is, um, you probably know this anyway, but full of those omega-3s, um, which are also really favourable for someone like you. Now, for protein portions at lunch, um, a palm size is a good uh, portion size for most people. Put in some spinach, some tomatoes, cucumber, whatever it is in season. And um, you could even chuck some pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds or something like that. Dr. William Ferguson told me I can't eat too much fat, especially saturated fat, so Mickey tells me what fats are best. Olive oil, avocado, macadamia nut oil, those types of fats are, are great because they're high in monounsaturated fat, which is fairly benign. Um, saturated fat in small amounts is, you know, not a problem, so something like coconut oil, you know, when you're cooking a little bit of that, that's not going to be an issue for you. Um, Nuts, brilliant, and raw is, is best. Butter, to my mind, is better than margarine because it's um, much more natural. And margarine is made up of vegetable oils, which are highly refined, and um, that's been shown to... Um, those highly refined omega-6 oils can be pro-inflammatory in the body, so it can increase inflammation. William also told me I have less tolerance for carbohydrate, but Mickey has a plan to tackle that too. So carbs, Simon, are your fruits, vegetables, your starches like potato, sweet potato, uh, your grains like your flours and your breads, and legumes like chickpeas and red kidney beans and those sorts of things. So the ones which um, someone like you and, and other people with diabetes want to focus on is getting you know, an abundance of the carbohydrate from the, from the vegetables. Really good amounts of vegetables, at least half of your plate should be vegetables. So what do you think of me eating rice, pasta? Best avoided. They're nutrient void and they're energy dense. For someone with diabetes, Having a cup of cooked rice is equivalent to having, say, 10 teaspoons of glucose. So it's going to hit your bloodstream really quick and your body is unable to cope with that. So you are better off having a fist-sized um, baked kumara or um, potato. If you take a um, potato and you cook it and you cool it down and you eat it cold, then the, the starch in the potato changes its structure and becomes resistant to digestion. So your, you don't digest it, but your gut bacteria does. And it's really good for your gut, um, and it's also much better for you. Eating right is vitally important for good physical health, but new research shows it might improve mental health as well. I've come to Melbourne to speak with Dr. Felice Jacker, a population epidemiologist who studies food and its relation to mental health. Since about 2009, 2010, there have been um, a, a large number of these epidemiological studies, like the ones that I run, that have looked at uh, the links between people's diets and the quality of their diet and whether or not they have, in particular, depression. That's mainly what we've focused on. And over and over again, we've seen that people who have 
more unhealthy processed foods seem to be more at risk of depression. And we see this across countries, cultures and age groups. One key study looked at older people and whether the quality of their diet affected a particular area of the brain. So this area of the brain is called the hippocampus. It seems to be very centrally involved in mental disorders, but also in learning and memory. So it's really important for people's ability to think and learn and remember. Now, what we saw in this study was really quite stunning. We saw that those with poorer diets had smaller hippocampi, those with better diets had larger hippocampi. And this wasn't just a trivial amount. In fact, the relationship of the diet explained about 60% of the age-related decline. So it wasn't a tiny effect, it was a large effect. Now, we saw this in older people, but of course it has implications right across the age range. So it's clear that a poor diet can have a serious impact on the brain, but I want to know if eating good foods can improve mental health. Now we've just finished the very first randomised controlled trial to actually investigate that and what we've found absolutely floored us because we found a very highly significant effect of dietary improvement on people's symptoms of depression. So people who received this dietary intervention, a very large number of them actually went into what we call remission, they became non-depressed. Now what this tells us is a couple of things. One, that there probably is a causal relationship. So diet is actually influencing mental health. But it's also saying that this is something that we can really readily implement in clinical practice. Most people with depression end up going to see their doctor. Many people with depression also have elevated risk factors for heart disease, diabetes, obesity. If you get people in uh, the GP office or with their psychiatrist, etc., and help them to improve their diet, that's gonna not only help their depression, but also the other aspects of disease that go with it. So this is a really simple and straightforward intervention that could have huge benefits at the clinical coalface, but also from a public health level. What I've learned is that junk food is everywhere. It's extremely appealing to the brain and it's really bad for us, not only physically, but mentally. So I want to put what I've learned into practice and see if I can find something good amongst all the bad. Well, there's a little bit of everything on here from uh, starters, house organic salads, there's a plain chuck burger, veggie burger, then there's the giant. Stack of cheddar cheese and peppers, jack cheese, avocado. Or I could go for the country fried steak, not. <laughs> that's actually a steak that's breaded and then deep fried. I settle on the Baja chicken salad. Let's hope it's the right choice. Hey, anything All right. Anything else I can get for you? That looks pretty good, thank you. All right, excellent. Grilled right. chicken, perfectly cooked, avocado on top. Crispy, fresh salad with tomato. Really, really tasty. Only bad thing is this sort of uh, taco shell on top that's been uh, sprinkled on to give it texture, which is a great idea, but just not so good for me, but it's delicious. Well, I've had my American diner experience and there were plenty of bad options available for me to choose but I was able to make the right choice and have a healthy salad. It was simple, it was tasty, I feel full, and I feel good that that's what I had.